jambo mbele zako bwana unaweza na ndipo mataifa yote vizazi vyote vina kufahamu ya kwamba wewe ni Mungu usiyeshindwa lime ilu lime ilu liwale no lako oh. once again i come to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to glorify his name for saving us by his grace. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. By his grace, we are what we are today. And I want to bring the word of God from, uh, to you from Full Gospel Churches of Kenya here in Meru Town. And we continue from where we left last Sunday. We are discussing a topic, uh, the grace of God. And uh, last week, we started by defining the grace. And we said, grace is God's enabling power. Grace is God's unmerited favor towards those who do not deserve. We don't qualify. We don't merit. But God gives us that gift unconditionally for our good. 
and for our continuity, for our progress, and for our growth. Do you know the law tells us how crooked we are, but grace comes along and straightens you and me out. Grace comes to put us, to align us into the will and the plan of God. And last week we said, number one, why we need the grace of God. Reason number one, why we need the grace of God. We read Ephesians 2, 8. We need grace of God for salvation. The Bible says, for it is by grace you have been saved. So we need grace for salvation. After salvation, I'll continue today. We need grace number two to teach us to say no to ungodliness, to worldliness. When we give our uh, lives to Jesus after salvation, grace will follow us through to teach us. Titus chapter 2 verse 11, a very powerful scripture, tells us, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no, capital no, to number one and godliness, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Therefore, we need the grace of God to teach us to say no to all form of ungodliness. My brothers and sisters, the law is good. The law I write to us the do's and the don'ts. What is right and what is wrong. But the law does not give us ability to resist sin. Ability to resist the influence of the world in our lives. But this grace that saves us, this grace, when we become obedient to this grace, it will teach us to say no to all forms of ungodliness. Number two, to all forms of worldly passions. And number three, that grace will teach you, it will teach me to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Now, God is a father. And every family has values. Every family has some principles that guide the members of the family. When we come to the family of God, and God becomes our father, he, he teaches us his family values. Those values come to us through Grace. Grace is God's enabling power. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke. Another version says, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be wary of his reproof, my son. God being our father, he wants his sons and daughters to behave in a certain way that glorifies his name, but also in a way that brings honor to his name as a father. So God will keep on reproving us. He will keep on rebuking us. The Lord will keep on disciplining us. And that work will be done by grace. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 to 12, highlights some of the things that the grace of God will help us overcome or deal with when we get saved. Verse 5 says, there are some things that we need to put to death. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. One of them is sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. 
And because of these things, the love of God is coming. And the verse 7 says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now, after getting saved, number two, the grace will help you, now that you are saved, to put to death, but also, the Bible says, you must lead yourself. Of all such things, such as anger, wrench, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. The grace of God will address the desires of the flesh. But also number two, the grace of God will address your, your emotions. How to deal with your emotions. How do you what, how do you deal with anger, with malice, with slander, with your filthy language when you come to the Lord? Verse 9 talks about lying. The grace of God will teach you not to lie. The grace of God will teach you some values. Verse 12, therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, number one. Kindness, number two. Humility, number three. Gentleness, number four. And patience, number five. Bear with each other. Forgive each other whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So, and verse 14, and of all this virtue, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. The grace that we are talking about will shape your character. This grace will help you deal with your weaknesses. This grace will help you, will shape your value systems, will produce the gift of the Holy Spirit in you. The fruit of the Holy Spirit will be developed in you when you enroll into the school of grace. As a human being, in a, no, a normal human being becomes very hard to forgive and forget. Actually, people say, I, can for, I will forgive, but I will not forget. But when grace comes in your life, grace will teach you to forgive. It will teach you to bear with other people. This grace will teach you to forgive and forget, which is very difficult. First John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, we are still looking at the grace which will teach us to say no to all ungodliness and worldly passion. Verse 15 says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of the Father lives forever. My brothers and my sisters, I want to submit to you that worldly passions are a reality. Yes, a normal human being struggles with the cravings of sinful man. Lust is in us. Lust and uh, even uh, pride is in us. Boasting is a normal human being way of living. But when we come to the Lord, he gives us grace. This grace will teach us. This grace will keep on teaching us correcting us, rebuking us until we take the shape of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our standard measure. 
And the grace will teach you to become like Jesus. Actually, Jesus is the full representation of grace. We can even call Jesus grace. He is actually the grace. He will teach you how to become like him. To be graceful like him. So, grace teaches us to say no. Number three. Grace helps us in our weaknesses. As human beings, we are weak. You are weak. I am weak. You are weak in some areas. I'm strong in some areas. And that's why we encourage couples in a family setup to complement one another, not to compete. You complement one another. Even at the office. We need to compliment one another, not to compete. Because what you are good at, I might be weak in that area. But when the grace of God comes upon your life and upon my life, the grace helps us in our weaknesses. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 and 9. Second Corinthians 12, 7 to 9. To keep me from becoming conceited because of this surpassingly great revelation. There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weaknesses. Therefore, I will not boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Brother Paul was struggling with what he is calling a thorn in his flesh. Bible scholars have not told us exactly what he was struggling with. Some think it's a sickness that uh, he was struggling with. He was terminally ill. Other Bible scholars think that uh, this thorn in his flesh was his singleness because he was not married. He was not married. Maybe he was struggling with singleness. But whichever way, let's uh, just call it a thorn in the flesh. And this thorn in the flesh, he calls it a message of, the, of Satan to torment him. This man was tormented. He struggled. He prayed about it. And remember, this is uh, Apostle Paul, a man that God used to perform miracles, signs, and wonders. This man was struggling. With, was tormented in this condition. But when he prayed about it, God said, I'm not going to take away the thorn from your flesh, but I'm going to give you something good and something sweet. I'm going to give you grace that will be sufficient. And that grace will make you perfect in your weakness, says. My brothers and sisters, I don't know what you are struggling with in your Christian life in your marriage, in your family, in your body. Maybe you are sick. You are struggling with a sickness that is using your money. Maybe you are struggling with uh, esteem issues. You have, uh, you have low self-esteem. Maybe you are struggling with depression and stress. A, a sickness that really has shocked you. I pray that God will give you grace to deal with that situation in that family. You need that grace in that weakness. So that that grace will give you the grace to go through that situation in the name of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Hebrews 4 16 the Bible says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace grace to help us in our time of need. Let us find grace to help us in our time of need. What you need 
in your weakest points. Apart from external encouragement and being hopeful in life. Apart from motivation talk and uh, people encouraging you. You also need the grace of God that will help you in your time of need. Grace that will help me in my time of need. May the Lord release that grace in your life in the mighty name of Jesus our Savior. Number four, we need grace for kingdom service. Grace for kingdom service. You can never serve God without grace. You will always be murmuring and complaining. You will hate people. If you do ministry without grace, if you serve that choir without grace, if you become an usher in the church without grace, I tell you, within three months you'll give up because serving people is not easy. Serving God through people is difficult. And you know what? The people that you invest in so much financially, time-wise, emotionally, are the same people when they betray you, when they speak negative about you, they will hurt you the most. You need the grace of God to help you to do kingdom service. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. First Peter 4.10 each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Faithy free administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very word of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. So that in all things... God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Everybody shout amen. This grace will give you the stamina, the joy that you need as you serve people using your gift. Whatever gift you have, you need that grief, that gift needs to be backed with God's grace. That's why I say it, grace is grease. You know, when you move one machine parts to move faster, like even in a wheelbarrow, if you want to use less effort, less energy, what you need is the grace. That grease will make work easy. The same in service. If you don't have God's grace, you are going to struggle. You are going to strain. You are going to complain. You are going to sigh. You are going to mama. But when you have the grace, this grace will help you to feel free and minister God's grace in its various forms. And all of us, we have different gifts. We have different talents. The Bible says here, if your gift is speaking, like what I am doing now, Speak the word of God with grace. If it's counseling, speak to people with grace. Speak to your children with grace. Speak to your wife with grace. If you lack grace in marriage, if you, you, you lack grace in your business, your customers are going to run away. You need grace as you speak to your customers in that business, in that hotel. You need the grace of God. To help you to prosper in business. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. My brothers and sisters, serving people can be tedious. Serving people can be annoying. Uh, serving people leaves you tired, worn out. You need the grace of God to serve people. Right from your marriage. From your family, to your office, to the church, to the community. What you need in the church and even in political arena. What you need is the grace of God. Romans 12 verse 6. I write 
some of the gifts. The Bible has told us in 1 Peter that whatever gift you have received to serve others. Romans gives us examples of those gifts. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. Note that. Gifts are given and they are in levels of grace. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. My brothers and sisters, the Bible has given us examples of gifts. Gifts. Examples of serving. All these gifts even are contributing to the needs of others. The gifts of encouragement. The gifts of leadership. The gifts of showing mercy. All these are gifts of the Holy Spirit. Please use these gifts to serve other people being enabled by grace. If you do it by flesh and blood, you are going to hate people, you are going to give up, you are going to stop serving. And I have seen many, many people stop serving the Lord in charge because it is not easy to serve without grace. As I finish, let me quote two more verses on service, then we shall continue from there next week. Second Corinthians 9, 8. We are talking about grace and grace in service. And God is able to make all grace abound to us so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Abounding in every good work requires first you abound in grace. You cannot abound in grace if you don't have. I mean, you cannot abound in every good work if you don't. You don't first abound in grace. That is Second Corinthians nine eight. First Corinthians three ten. By the grace God has given me, I laid the foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. By the grace of God. God, in his grace, allowed me, enabled me to raise the foundation. Others are building on it. You can never raise a foundation that is firm without God's grace. And I want, you to, I want to highlight something on foundation. Every strong house has a very strong and firm foundation. But do you know what? The foundation is not seen. Many a times the foundation is underneath. It is never seen. It is never valued. It's never painted. The foundation. People never talk anything about the foundation. They see the walls. They see the floor. They see other parts of the house but they don't see the foundation. I want to talk to founders here. Founders of churches. Founders of businesses. Founders even of a nation like this. The people that we call them the founding fathers of this nation. Many of them paid the costs of making sure that there is independence in Kenya. But majority of the founders, they don't enjoy the fruits. They don't. So Paul says, it's by the grace of God I laid the foundation and somebody else is building on it. When you laid a foundation with grace, 
you will never be bitter when you see other people building on that foundation if, even if they don't remember the person who laid the foundation. You are not going to be bitter because the grace enabled you to lay the foundation for the glory of the name of Jesus. I have found founders of churches and ministries, founders of businesses who are very bitter in their old age because the people who took over and continued building on the foundation they laid, they disregarded them. They don't recognize them. They don't even mention them. They forgot them. I want to also appeal to those who are building on the foundation. Let us not forget our fathers who struggled. If they are still alive, please make sure that you recognize them. Make sure that you bless them and remember them, especially your parents who are the found, uh, they form a very strong foundation of your life. They educated you. They made you what you are today. Remember the men and women that God has used to lay the foundation of your life, the foundation of your ministry. Remember your biological parents. Remember your spiritual parents who laid the foundation of what you are enjoying today. Even that business that you have inherited, please don't forget the founders. So, by the grace of God, Paul is saying, I've, I laid the foundation and as an expert builder and someone else is building on it. Even continuing building on it, you need the grace of God. May the Lord bless you for following this uh, program on the grace of God. Today we have looked at the grace of God that will teach you to say no and the grace of God that will help you to say uh, to, to, to help you in your weaknesses and finally the grace that you need to help you in serving God's kingdom. We shall continue from there next week and I want to pray with you that the Lord God will give you grace. If you are not born again, there is grace for your salvation. And if you are discouraged or you are weak somewhere, the grace of God will heal you. The grace of God will lift you. The grace of God will establish you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace that you are releasing in our lives today. I come before you are throne of grace together with my viewers here. Lord, you know what they are going through. You know their weaknesses. You know their challenges. You know, God, their pains and their sorrows. We come to you praying that the grace will teach them to say no to every ungodliness. The grace of God will help them in their weaknesses. And finally, as they serve you through people, the grace of God will help them to do service in your kingdom. I thank you for teaching us today. I pray that we shall invest more time in prayer and studying your word so that we may discover your grace and also grow in the knowledge of that grace. Take care of us, Heavenly Father. Fight all our battles. Prove yourself strong on our behalf. In Jesus' name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. God bless you and have a fruitful week to the glory of the name of our God. Thank you.